Good evening, everyone. I'm Judy Reese Morse, President and CEO of the Urban League of Louisiana. Welcome to this evening's candidate forum featuring candidates running for Council District D. We're so glad that you've made time in your schedule to hear from the individuals you'll see on the ballot on November 13th. The Urban League is hosting forums like this one to give you the opportunity to hear directly from those who are seeking your vote. We want you to hear firsthand about the vision that each candidate has for our community so that you are able to make an informed decision when you cast your ballot. The Urban League of Louisiana is deeply committed to voter education, voter engagement, and voter mobilization. Our Wake Up Go Vote initiative is a statewide effort that allows us to work with you to engage and to take action that will lead to stronger, thriving, prosperous communities. We believe that your vote is your voice and we want the voices of our communities to be heard loud and clear. The first step is getting to know who your choices are for elective office. The Urban League has a long history of fighting for voting rights for African-Americans. Nationally, the fight continues to pass comprehensive voting rights and election system reform, including the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. And while passage of a version in the House of Representatives represents progress, the work to be done is now in the Senate. We ask you to add your voice to the work of the National Urban League as they continue to advocate for passage of this important civil rights legislation. Right here in Louisiana, work is being done every day to promote voter engagement and to protect against voter suppression of any kind. We've been proud to stand with the Power Coalition for Equity and Justice in support of voter fairness and equity. We're also extremely proud to partner with the Power Coalition on hosting this evening's forum. It is my pleasure to introduce Morgan Shannon with the Power Coalition, who will share a few words of welcome. Good evening, Morgan. Thank you, Judy, and welcome, everyone. We appreciate the partnership of the Urban League of Louisiana. The Power Coalition is a statewide civic engagement table that works to build power in Black and other oppressed communities of color throughout Louisiana. We believe that your vote is your power. We ask you to visit thepowercoalition.org and check out our resources. There are a lot there. We have things around how you can fully participate in democracy, including redistricting, the upcoming redistricting cycle. Um, so check out where your roadshow and your uh, legislators will be talking about fair maps and equitable representation and voting um, November 13th and December 11th. We know that our folks need to fully engage in this democracy and this process. And we want to knock down any barriers. We are a black woman led organization, just like the Urban League of Louisiana. And we appreciate the deep partnership. We ask you to listen today to your candidates, make sure that they are representing fully you and check your voter registration status and make sure you have a voter a plan, that you know how you're going to get to your polling location, that you know where your polling location is, and that you are registered to vote and everyone in your household is. I'm going to turn it back to the Urban League. Thank you so much, Morgan. Thank you for the great work that you do every day. And again, we are so grateful to be able to partner with you, with your founder and CEO, Ashley Shelton, and the entire team at the Power Coalition. It is now my pleasure to introduce our moderator for this evening's forum. Jay Brown Russell is the founder and principal of JD Russell Consulting with over 17 years of legal experience and 15 years of diversity, equity and inclusion experience. Jade has consistently delivered results for her clients and focuses her efforts on systemic, sustainable and equitable reform. Jade is civically active with a long list of organizations, too long to list them all this evening, but she's currently serving as chairwoman of the Urban League of Louisiana Board of Directors and as a commissioner of the Resilient Louisiana Commission. Jade, good evening and thank you for being our moderator this evening. 
Thank you so much, Judy, um, for having me. My name is Jade Brown Russell. I am your moderator for this evening. First, um, let me thank Judy Reese Morris, our president and CEO of the Urban League of Louisiana, as well uh, as our uh, treasure partners at the P Power Coalition for Equity and Justice. Um, I also want to thank um, the candidates for joining us tonight um, and taking out, out time of what I know are very, very busy schedules um, in the middle of campaigning. And um, I would also like to thank the voting public for those of you who have tuned in. Um, I want to thank our candidates for giving the voting public an opportunity to hear your visions for the public offices that you seek uh, to hold. As you heard, the Urban League of Louisiana and the Power Coalition for Equity and Justice um, are hosting this and other forums um, to give the voting public, give those who are tuning in, a chance to learn more about these candidates um, that you will see on the ballot this November. So tonight, um, we have the distinct honor and privilege of um, being joined by the candidates for New Orleans City Council candidate District D. Um, I'm very excited to hear from these candidates. The questions for candidates have been de uh, designed by the Urban League um, and by Power Coalition to focus on those issues um, that, uh, that they hear, both organizations hear regularly throughout the community that they serve and advocate for. Um, the topics are include things such as racial equity, equitable workforces and economic opportunity, budgeting, disaster response and more. So uh, all candidates will be, um, have been invited just so you know, um, we, we have um, several candidates here uh, with us today and all candidates have received these questions um, in advance. Um, I'll introduce the candidates running for District D and ask them to provide one minute opening uh, statements to introduce themselves. So candidates, I'm going to actually read through the list of those of you who have joined us and then I will call on you one by one to um, provide your opening statement. We have Chelsea Ardon, Chantrice Burnett, Morgan Clevenger, Troy Glover, Eugene Green, Kevin Griffin Clark, Mark Johari Laws, Mariah Moore, Robert, I'm sorry, and Timlin, Tim Sams. Uh, again, candidates, thank you for um, joining us tonight. I am first going to call on Chelsea Ardwan to provide opening state her opening statement. Um, I'm not sure. I am not seeing Chelsea. Um, we will uh, we will skip Chelsea if she happens to join us before the end of opening statements. We'll come back to her. Chantrice Burnett. Good evening, Urban League and Power Coalition. I first want to thank you all for hosting this forum and giving us this platform this afternoon. I am Chantrice Burnett, and I am the candidate for City Council District D and number 53 on the ballot. I am a local born and raised native of New Orleans, Louisiana, a proud McDonald 35 graduate and two time graduate of Southern University, completing my education with a master's in public administration, concentrating in public policy. I am in this race, not for myself or not for any friend or family member. I am in this race for the residents of District D. It is for far too long we have been with the short end of what we for long deserve um, through our tax dollars, which is complete street infrastructure, safe communities to raise our families, and economic opportunity that gives our families not only a living wage, but a saving wage. Again, I am Chantrice Burnett, number 53 on your ballot, asking for your support and vote in this upcoming election for fresh new ideas that will represent all of the residents of District D. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Burnett. We'll now move forward to uh, Ms. Morgan Clevenger. Thank you so much, Urban League and Power Coalition. You do such great work in the community. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm Morgan Clevenger, a native New Orleanian, born and raised in the sixth and seventh ward and still a resident of the seventh ward. Um, you know, my parents were civil rights activists of the 60s 
and that laid the foundation for who I am and what I've done in my life and has guided everything I've done in terms of equity and inclusion and fighting for the people. I have a very long record in the community of standing up and standing out for big issues and small. Um, and I know that I have that leadership quality and the care for our residents to make a difference as your city council member for District D. We have a lot of work to do. Uh, we're at a pivotal moment in our city and it's time for District D to get the revitalization, the resources and the reinvestment that we need. I'm Morgan Clevenger, number 54 on the ballot. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Clevenger. We will now move forward uh, with an opening statement from Mr. Troy Glover. Yep, thank you, Jade, and everybody for this time um, and the Power Coalition as well. Uh, my name is Troy Glover. I am the father to my 11-year-old daughter, Tralia, and my two-year-old son, Deuce. I'm also born in New Orleans. I attended the best high school in New Orleans, McDonald 35, and graduated from UNO with a degree in political science. I was raised uptown um, in the Kelly Oak Projects to a single mama after my dad was killed when I was one. And while taking care of my two sisters, I was arrested while I was 17. I'm running for city council because someone with that story doesn't get to run for city council. I am now the New Orleans director for an organization and, and a business um, that with an operating budget of $5 million that only hire folks returning home from incarceration um, and cut down blighted lots within the community. And if we know there is about 50% of black men in the city that's unemployed. Um, and so we're working directly to stabilize family. Um, I'm also the past president of the St. Rock Neighborhood Association. And what I fought to get sandbags, um, done gun buybacks and fought to get guns off the street. I love this city um, and the people of this city with all my heart and the people of this district with all my heart. Um, and I know that we deserve better. Um, and that's why I'm running for city council because I'm qualified um, and I love this district. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Glover. We'll now move forward to Mr. Eugene Green for his opening statement. I am pleased to have the opportunity to speak. I'd like to just note that the instructions say that the host has stopped my ability to do my video. And so I'd like to be on video. Okay, there you go. Just stop my video. Um, I'm Eugene Green, and I'm pleased to have an opportunity to be a candidate for the City Council representing District D, the district in which I grew up. I grew up in the Punta Train Park area, also in the Sugar Hill area near Dilley University. And for the last 33 years, I've lived right here on, on St. Rock Avenue in the Gentilly Terrace subdivision where I've raised my three children. I've been here for most of my life. I went away to school. I had an opportunity to go to Harvard University undergraduate and worked with Xerox and IBM in Massachusetts, but couldn't wait to get back to New Orleans to make a difference in the community that I love. I am the son of two educators. I am very motivated by business development. I've built a business for the last 33 years here in our city, but I've also had a chance to serve in the public sector on a federal, state, and local level as the chief of staff for a congressman as also the head of an industrial park in New Orleans East and as the head of economic development for the city. I am running because I have experience and skills that I feel can help enhance the quality of life for the citizens of the district and the city that I enjoy. And thank you, Urban League of Louisiana and Power Coalition for giving us this opportunity to speak to you tonight. I'm number 57 on the ballot, Eugene Green. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Green. Uh, we'll now move forward with uh, Kevin Griffin Clark. Mr. Clark, you can open up. I'm sorry, Mr. Griffin Clark, you can open up with your uh, opening statement. Mr. Clark, you're on mute. I think we should restart his time. I'm sorry. No. Am I there good? You go. Yep, now you're good. Sorry about that. Uh, Urban League and Power Coalition, first of all, thank you guys so much uh, for having this forum and, and inviting me. Uh, again, my name is Kevin Griffin Clark. Uh, I am a son of the district, born in the St. Bernard Housing Project, uh, and have uh, lived in the district my entire life. I am a father, I'm a husband, uh, I'm a minister, and as well uh, as a entrepreneur and business owner of uh, several different businesses. Uh, I'm sorry, two of them which are in the district. Um, one of the main reasons I wanted to run for this seat is because District D needed a fighter. Um, I don't have a bunch of the political experience 
uh, and background, but I have fighting experience for our community and for its residents. Uh, for the past 20 plus years, I've been fighting for those formerly incarcerated and mainly fighting for our young people who are not just our future, but are our today. Uh, so they want to make sure, I want to make sure that um, our young people and those who cannot fight for themselves and those who are not politically savvy and aren't uh, attached to different alphabet groups in our political communities have a fighting chance uh, in this. Um, I am pleased to be backed by uh, a bunch of workers when it comes down to the AFL-CIO, as well as UTNO and a bunch of community uh, leaders here in our city when it comes down to this race. Um, and again, um, for all my life, I've been a fighter and I wanna make sure that we continue this fight on Perdido Street. Uh, my name is Kevin Griffin Clark, number 58 on your ballot. Peace and love. Thank you so much, Mr. Griffin Clark. Uh, we will now move forward to uh, Mariah Moore. You may now make your opening statement. Well, hello everyone. And thank you so much for inviting me to this one wonderful forum. And uh, my name is Mariah Moore. I am a community activist and advocate. Uh, I am a nonprofit executive. Uh, and a true just community leader who makes decisions that benefit uh, the folks of our city and my community. Um, for a long time, uh, I have faced housing discrimination, insecurity, job discrimination and insecurity. So I understand exactly what New Orleanians today are facing. Uh, many, many, many disparities. Through my work for Hurricane Ida, I was able to redistribute over $140,000 right back into the hands of New Orleanians, not just throughout the district, but throughout the city before FEMA stepped in to administer a dollar. That, uh, that, um, that is the representation that we need. As far as uh, my race, I know that I am the candidate of choice because I always make decisions that are in the best interest of our people. Uh, I am a native New Orleanian. I am a nonprofit executive. I am transparent, loving, and caring. I'm number 60 on the ballot, and my name is Mariah Moore. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Moore. Uh, we will now move forward to Timalyn Tim Sands. Um, you are uh, now able to give your opening statement. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Urban League and Power Coalition and Jade Russell for hosting us on this evening. I'm really excited about being here. My name is Timalyn Tim, as some like to call me, Sams. I'm a native New Orleanian who has dedicated my career and to improving the quality of life for children and families across New Orleans' social and cultural boundaries. You know, there is a, there is a need for change in the city of New Orleans. Social and economic equity are lacking. In 2006, I returned home after being displaced by Hurricane Katrina like many others with the promises that if I come back with my family, I would be investing in the city and I will re receive a return on my investment. Those promises were not kept. It's time for New Orleans to provide the good life for everyone. I'm running for city council district D because district D needs a strong voice in the city council. District D needs someone who will meet with both neighborhoods and city officials and work together to solve the problems of District D and get us back on track. Again, my name is Timalyn Sams, Tim, and I'm number 63 on your ballot. Thank you, Ms. Sams. I will now thank all of you for your opening statements. We'll now move to our first round of questions. Uh, each candidate will have uh, a opportunity to respond to each question. There will be three questions in this round and each candidate will have 30 seconds um, to respond to these questions. We'll start with um, at the top and then as we um, move to the next question, we'll st start from the bottom uh, and work our way back up. So the first question, um, I'm going to start with Ms. Chantrice Burnett. Uh, and the question for all candidates is, what do you think are the most important functions of a council person? Ms. Burnett? So uh, some of the most important functions as a council person is zoning, regulating, and budgeting. And in those, in those responsibilities, we have already seen because of our previous councils that our 
representation in our district has been lacking. So for zoning, we can stop things such as the Garden Plaza uh, families, uh, make sure that those that those issues never happen again. With budgeting, we can make sure that we are holding accountable to the different agencies that we're giving funding to, but not receiving the, the benefits uh, of service. And as far as regulating, make sure that we are keeping uh, large companies like Entergy and Sewage and Water Board under checks and balances so that our people aren't receiving the burden of costs from larger corporations. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Ms. Burnett. Ms. Clevenger? Hi. Um, the most important function of a city council member is to represent, serve, and advocate for all the residents of their district. Not just the folks that elected them or any, you know, special group, all the residents of the district. Um, the other very important function of city council is to serve as a legislative body and as the check and balance to the executive branch, the administration. And so we do need strong council people um, to address the, the really systemic problems that we have in this city. And every time we have a disaster, and now we have a triple disaster, every time those inequities are laid bare and we find the dysfunction and so we need council people who understand their role. The other piece is as a budget um, oversight, they have the city council members have the power to direct resources where they need to go. We have a bottleneck constantly and we don't see the resources getting into the communities where they need to be. As a land use body, it's so important because- 30 seconds have expired. You can go ahead and finish your thought, but you're 30 seconds. And a lot of people don't realize that. Um, the regulatory, regulatory body as, as uh, the regulation of utilities, that's huge. Intergy has failed the people of the city and we have to look at the city council members who have not done the best job they can in terms of regulating the utilities that put the cost burden on our people. That's what we need to do, lift that cost burden so we can not just survive, but thrive. Thank you. Mr. Glover? Yep, thank you. Um, I, I think the most important function of the city council is one, um, especially district, district D, is to know um, and be a champion for all 26 neighborhoods in District D um, and to know them intimately and support them intimately. Now for the actual functions, um, I think being that we're only one of two regulatory bodies in the city um, that regulate, regu regulates utility, um, that's a super important function. And we've seen that um, coming off the hills of Hurricane Ida. Um, the second one is the legislative body um, of government, as Morgan said, um, some things that matter into the district. 74% of residents say that they don't feel safe um, in a district and nearly 50% of black kids in this city still live in poverty. As a city council person, we have authority to create policies to change um, and to create a more equitable district. And last thing is the budget. Um, there's about a $607 million recurring revenue for the city, right? And your budget is a reflection of your priorities. So ensuring that our priorities match the needs of the district. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Glover. Uh, Mr. Green. The home rule charter of the city of New Orleans is because all of the legislative powers are invested in the city council. Oversight, authority, and the investigative authority, which are awesome responsibilities. The most important thing for the city council and the most important function in answering your question in a short manner is to know and to hear from the citizens what their priorities are and what the needs are to introduce legislation in the form of ordinances that enhance the quality of life and enhance health, to conduct oversight and investigations where it is necessary to achieve good government and to help the citizens to improve the quality of their life. So once again, the Home Root Charter defines the awesome responsibility of the city council. All legislative powers, all ordinances come through the city council. And I'm looking forward to using that pulpit to be able to bring positive change to our city. city. Thank you, Mr. Green. Mr. Griffin Clark. 
Yes, um, I think a few of the um, most important functions of the council uh, is our advocacy, which is our regulatory uh, situation where we make sure that we are doing all of the checks and balances when it comes down to the uh, agencies that we regulate. Um, also, an another thing is, is mainly our budget. Show me what you spend your money on and I'll show you what you value. Um, we, we, for the longest, have had a strong mayor, strong council situation. And so I believe um, that our budget is, is really, really heavy when it comes out of that. And then also uh, law creation. So, and, and being the, the legislative body uh, of our city, there's, there's so many things that hold us back um, when it comes down to being a, a, um, a, a law feeling uh, area in the city that we have to make sure that a lot of the laws that we create are equitable for, for everyone and not just for some um, that, are, that are pushed down on them heavy, especially when it comes down to like the cases when it comes down to marijuana and, and, and things of that nature. Thank you, Mr. Griffin Clark. Um, Ms. Moore. Yes, and so much of what everyone has said was um, so well thought out. Uh, so for me, uh, one of the biggest things for me is making sure that we're listening to our constituents and, and, and taking in their complaints and their concerns uh, and addressing those. Also making sure that our budget is working for our people, making sure that we're passing laws and ordinances that are in the best interest of our people. Uh, also making sure that we're representing our community at, at all different governmental levels, at a state level uh, and at a federal level, uh, because we do not only represent our people inside of this city, that goes far uh, beyond uh, the boundaries of this city. So that's uh, what's important for me as a city council member. Thank you, Ms. Moore. Ms. Uh, Timberland Sands. There we are, thanks. So the city council has a lot of powers as we've heard so far, right? Um, and what we know is that the city prospers when everyone prospers. In order to truly thrive, New Orleans must model addressing inequity in all of our communities. But one of the most important things that I believe um, is the function of city council is to serve as the, the fiduciary responsibility to architect the future of New Orleans, to ensure that we are sustainable and that we have that our lives and our quality of life is sustained. Thank you, Ms. Sams. This next question, I'm actually gonna come right back to you, Ms. Sams, to start with you and we'll work our way back up the, to the top of the candidate list. This question is, how do you plan to engage with the residents of your district if you are elected? Ms. Sands. So some of the things that I know about engagement is, is a, it's a ladder. It's not one stop shop. And so I plan to utilize every vehicle afforded to me. I'd like to do a state of the district at least twice a year. One thing that I know worked immediately after the storm with convening neighborhoods, neighborhoods have all types of meetings. But when we, when we bring them together and have conversations about what our priorities are together, then we get a different outcome. I'd also like to highlight our businesses within the district and start talking about what do we do and how do we serve those people in our district and work with those businesses, that, businesses in our district. So I wanna do a spotlight of the business. I've talked about doing Franklin Fridays on Franklin Avenue. You know, those are the things that I think, um, District D has a lot of economic corridors that are underutilized. And most people don't even know that there are small businesses in that area. I do everything in my district from getting my clothes and my groceries taken care of to um, getting my shoes fixed. And everyone knows me, who knows me? No, I love a good heel. So I believe that in order for me to engage the district, I have to utilize multiple facets and multiple platforms. Thank you, Miss um, Mariah Moore. Thank you so much. I think it begins with uh, once elected, making sure that you are using dollars to fully 
fund and staff your constituent services. Uh, I think a lot, a lot of our the folks that I've talked to, at least anyway, have said that they aren't confident in the constituent services that they've received or that they haven't received, right? They don't get emails back. They don't get phone calls back. So making sure we're on top of that and we have representatives uh, in those jobs to make sure that we're reaching everyone that we need to reach, making sure that I'm showing up in the district, making sure that I'm at least attending as many uh, neighborhood association meetings that I can, making sure that I'm visiting uh, the, throughout out the district with small business owners uh, uh, and entrepreneurs, uh, making sure that I'm visiting with uh, renters as well as homeowners uh, about what their concerns are. If I see anything on my way to my office or on my way back home that I'm stopping and addressing it and saying, okay, I'm taking note of these things. A lot of times I've seen people just walk right past it like it doesn't exist, but we have a unique opportunity to show up better. Uh, and that's what I wanna do. My neighbor recently was outside, his trash was swept down the street. And instead of just driving by him like I easily could have, I got out and I assisted him with collecting that trash. Uh, and so, you know, being a good neighbor, uh, because at the end of the day, we're still neighbors to each other in the district. Thank you, Ms. Moore. Uh, Mr. Kevin Griffin-Clark. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, one of the main uh, priorities for me is, and when it comes down to engaging the residents of the district is uh, making sure that we have a satellite office inside of the district that's run uh, that's run five days a week, just like the office in City Hall. There's nothing that says my office has to be on Perdido Street. Um, and we understand that most people kind of have a fear of going down there for several different reasons, uh, where there's kind of anxiety of dealing with all of that traffic and paying for stuff and things like that. Also bringing our technology into the 21st century. When there's a vote coming up um, for, for anything that I have to make sure I vote for, using text and email uh, voting and, and balloting to make sure that I'm not just voting my conscience, but I'm voting what the constituents want. Thank you so much, Mr. Griffin Clark. Uh, Mr. Green. I'm going to look at my notes on this one for a second because I wanted to make sure that I mentioned various ways that I'll be reaching out to our constituents, certainly attending as many neighborhood association meetings as there are. And I'm glad that in this district, there are a number of neighborhood associations that are active. I like to appear on radio talk shows, especially, and to talk to our constituents in general about some of the concerns um, and what we're doing. Um, Announcements shared by the city council are a great way of reaching people. We just gotta get those email addresses so that we can make sure that our email list is extensive. But using those tools that are available to us and taking nothing for granted, social media, texting, sending out a newsletter by email, sending out a newsletter by Instagram and, and other um, matters or inviting people to the links. Also using other tools that we have available to us. And one tool is that satellite office. I'd like to see a satellite office in the library on Gentilly, which is technically right now being utilized in a great way by our representatives of District D. Um, it's kind of being used as a satellite office. We do need to have places where people don't have to come and pay and park and deal with the hassles. And we also need to be sensitive to some of our elderly citizens who can't get down to City Hall. So those are the me various methods that I use to communicate with our citizens. And I look forward to using those seven or eight methods or so constantly to reach out to our citizens. Thank you, Mr. Green. Mr. Glover? Yeah, thank you, Jay. You know, at the core of this issue, I, I think it's about um, just being effectively um, present for neighbors. And I think my time as the president of the St. Rock Neighborhood Association, which was volunteer, and we had to go in front of the council and hunt down our council person a lot, um, really guides my view on this. So I think for me, it's four things. One, responding um, to text and email on time. So within 48 hours, um, and then two, using the neighborhood association, parks, restaurant businesses, that's really the hub of District D um, at support in that. Um, and three, changing the meeting time, just 10 o'clock time um, often um, is unreasonable for residents to get to. And lastly, I would say creating a District D advisory council made up of businesses, um, young people, uh, individuals, neighborhood association presidents, so that every decision isn't made on Perdido, but um, decisions are also made um, and advised in that space as well. So a district advisory council, which I think is a really good piece um, for it to be present with neighbors. Thank you, Mr. Glover. Uh, Ms. Morgan Clevenger. Okay. 
Thank you so much. This is the most important aspect of what we do as council people. Uh, it is to actually go out, be present, be there, and listen to the people. Because if we're not engaging the citizens on the front end, we always end up on the back end with people who are disappointed, who have not been heard, and who have not, who, whose voices have not been counted in terms of how we move forward. And I know as a longtime community activist, and as the president of Fairgrounds Triangle Neighborhood Association in the seventh ward since 2010, I have served as a de facto council person for many years. I'm typically the first person the residents is going to call when they have a concern. And then we filter it up to going to city council. But we've seen over and over how um, government does, does not engage our residents on the front end. And then we have to fight on the back end to be heard. And we have to change that. So yes, being present, being accountable, being committed, and actually being in the district. Um, we've, we've seen a, a real lack of neglect in District D for many years. It's hard to get an appointment. It's hard to get a return phone call. Um, and that's just not the way it, it, it has to be. And we can change that. District D is, is huge, it's diverse. We have a lot of different kinds of people living different kinds of lives. And it's not just about neighborhood associations. We have so many people that are not necessarily members of neighborhood associations. And we have a lot of seniors who cannot connect to social media or go downtown. So really listening, engaging and being present and also reforming how we do city council meetings and how we engage public comment, uh, that has to be looked at. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of work to do in that area for District D and I've been doing it. Thank you, Ms. Clevenger. Um, and the final uh, candidate for this question, Ms. Chantrice Burnett. Yes, so for me, being present is most important and being engaged into our, our constituents is most important. So just like now, I am knocking on your door asking for your vote. I will be knocking on your door saying, hi, how can we help you? These are the resources that we have available. So I would do that by one, hosting a monthly canvassing throughout the district in different parts. Because uh, just like now I'm canvassing, I will continue to canvass. Then second, I will host a bi-weekly town hall meeting, partnering with our co uh, community leaders and our neighborhood associations so that I myself, as well as members of my team can be present to hear the needs of the constituents in my district. And then third, I would like to host two quarterly um, community forums. The two is one for our residential community so that they can come out and I hear the needs of residents as a residential concern. And then second, from our community and business uh, partners in our district so that I can hear the concerns and uh, requests of our business community to know how we can better serve them. And then make, make sure that all of the resources that are accessible and available in our district are available to them at these quarterly forums. And so these are just some of the ways I would like to stay engaged and active and working with uh, the members of my community. Thank you. Thank you. And we have one more uh, 30 second question. Um, I'm getting nudged by our production team. We've got to stick to the 30 seconds, you guys, um, because we have several questions in the next round that we hopefully will be able to uh, ensure that everyone has the opportunity to answer. Uh, the last question on the 32nd um, um, list of questions is what are your top three priorities uh, for District D if elected to serve? I'm gonna start back at the top with Chantrice Burnett. So my top three priorities that I would like to uh, accomplish is community stimulus, making sure that I have uh, all the access and available resources available to the people in my district, economic opportunity, growing our economic industry outside of hospitality and tourism so that people can earn a savings wage uh, for their families. And then third, crime prevention, putting in place measures that address crime from the root causes of poverty and mental health that stops a lot of crime before it starts. That, that's my top three priorities. Thank you, Ms. Burnett. Ms. Clevenger? Yes, um, my top three priorities. The first one is to lift the economic burden off of our people. We are so cost burdened 
every time we turn around, there's there's more choices we have to make, whether we're going to pay Intergy or Sewage and Water Board or the property taxes and the fees and the fines. So we need to really drill down into that. And, and as a city council member, we have that opportunity to do so. Um, second one, revitalizing and reinvesting in District D because we have so many opportunities and assets. The biggest one are people. The people of District D are amazing. But we have four universities. We have so many economic corridors, um, including the St. Bernard Corridor, Dalman Road. We have a lot of opportunity in District D. And third, bringing more resources to the people and making sure that we don't have a bottleneck at the top, that when we have programs like being so active during COVID because I went, I participated in a number of your webinars and brought that information back to the people to help them try to access um, assistance. Not always successfully, but thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Clavenger. Mr. Glover. Yep, thank you. Um, so my top three priorities would be um, all falls into the bucket of quality of life. Um, and so first, I, I would say housing. So keeping a pause on evictions, um, ensuring that we regulate, regulate Airbnb. And then what we don't know is there's a 20 year affordable housing millage that ends at the end of this year. Um, and that's, that's been generating money for affordable housing for um, the last five years, so 20 years. So making sure that that stays. And then the city over the past five years set out to create 7,500 units of affordable housing. We've created 1,200. Um, and so ensuring that our people not only have a place to live, but have a place to stay, um, and then public safety, but approaching public safety in a different approach. In my role as um, director of CEO, I've been able to hire over 200 returning citizens. So folks who return home from incarceration and about 75 of those were in the district. So actually putting a footprint in that. And then lastly, infrastructure um, and economic development. We need a public facing dashboard that District B residents can see that updates us on infrastructure, projects throughout the district. People don't mind that um, we're, we're growing the district. People mind when we don't communicate about it. So those would be my top three priorities. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Glover. Mr. Green? My top priorities are enhancing public safety. And it's a very important issue for everyone in our district. It comes, it becomes personal sometimes. Today, um, for two hours, I, I was out in front of my house because unfortunately a young man, a little misguided young man stole an automobile led from the police, turned on to St. Rock Avenue at Mirabu, busted the tires of his um, of the vehicle that he had stolen, jumped across a couple of fences and created a tremendous, um, if you will, a tremendous incident. And I would like to work with more youth as I've been doing with the Silverback Society, but also working on other issues involving um, policing, also issues involving just public safety in general, looking at our prison and our returning citizens, how we can help them. Also, so that's one priority is public safety. The second priority would be to burden off of our citizens of some of the increasing costs. That includes making more affordable housing available for um, rent and also addressing sewage and water board energy issues and taxation issues. Support the measure that's going to be on the ballot next week to reduce those taxes. And I see you look, I've taken more than 30 seconds because I started off and I went on a tangent with regards to the incident. I leaned in on you. Did you see me leaning on you? Yes, I saw you leaning in. I'm sorry about that. But I started <laughs> off with something that just happened to me. That's why. But public <laughs> safety, reducing the burden on our citizens and reducing blight. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Green. Mr. Griffin Clark. Uh, yes. So economic development for us, one of the times we always talk about crime first, but in most situations, crime is derived when it, we don't have uh, economics in our community and we don't have it in our, our families and situations. I'm not worrying about what's on your plate if I have something uh, on mine. So making sure that we have uh, not just a, a minimum wage, but a living wage within all, especially in our city, uh, workers with a, with a living wage increase, like we as the city council have uh, added a few years ago. Um, and of course, second is, is crime and also not just um, with crime, but also making sure that the budget is taken care of when it comes down to 63% of the budget going towards our criminal justice and only 3% 
going towards uh, our youth and family services. Uh, and, and one of my uh, other ones is contracts, making sure that our small businesses uh, have access to these contracts that the city uh, gives out every year. We spend millions of dollars uh, inside of our city. And a lot of that can come to residents in our district and in our community. Thank you, Mr. Griffin Clark. Uh, Ms. Mariah Moore. Thank you so much. Um, I, I was gonna put it in the chat, but I did want to be respectful and come on camera and let you all know that unfortunately I do have to step away. Um, as a community activist and organizer, my commitment does not end because I chose to run for office. And I currently have uh, some folks who are in crisis at this very moment and my assistance is needed. So I thank you for the brief time that we were able to share together and the things that you were able to learn about me. And I hope that I'll see each and every one of you uh, and to the folks who are listening throughout the district uh, and the city on the campaign trail. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, and I will update uh, everyone about the situation. So thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Moore. Have a great night. Um, we will um, end this uh, round with Ms. Timelin Sands. So my three top priorities are making our community safe by making public safety, safety inclusive and making sure that multiple stakeholders are at the table as we are talking about community public safety. The other is advocating for housing and utility affordability. For our city to grow and thrive, it must provide quality and attainable rental and home ownership. You know, solving our affordable housing crisis isn't just about building more houses. We have a lot of substandard conditions in our housing market, in our, in our housing portfolio in District D, and we need to address our eviction crisis. And lastly, I would say developing an economy that empowers everyone, fostering an environment that promotes investment and encourages smart growth and development in all areas of the district. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Ms. Sams. We will now move to the next round of questions, which will be a one minute um, round of questions for responses. Um, please uh, keep your eye on the, the time clock um, that should be um, on your screen. We're going to start with Ms. Chelsea Ardwan, who um, has joined us um, for this round. Um, the first question is for all candidates, what specific things have you done in your district that demonstrate your ability to positively impact your district as a council person? Ms. Arden? Hi, yes, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. All right, wonderful. I apologize for the delay this evening. I did have a work emergency that ran over time. So I apologize and um, welcome and thank you for having me this evening. So one of the specific things that I did positively uh, impact the district was right after the hurricane, when we had not had our trash picked up since before the hurricane, I had my team go out with a dump trailer and actually started picking up the trash myself and dumping it at the Elysian Fields dump site. So I've already gone through many of the neighborhoods in District D and picked up the trash and uh, met our residents and asked what they what they needed specifically outside of just trash pickup and um, helped really, really kind of bring our neighborhood back to uh, normality as much as we can at this point. Thank you, Ms. Arnon. Um, Ms. Chantrice uh, Burnett. Um, so some of the things that I've done throughout the district that made positive impacts, um, I was, I, I'm formerly the youth service specialist uh, from uh, Total Community Action, where I service their, their summer camp experience hosting over 200 plus students over the last two years during the height of the pandemic at the St. Bernard Center. I've hosted uh, vaccine drives during the pandemic or right at the release of the vaccine. I uh, hosted food drives, supply giveaways, and then immediately after Ida, I was very present in the district helping uh, wherever I can uh, with residents and with, with whatever they needed. Thank you, Ms. Burnett. Ms. Morgan Clever Clevenger. 
Yes, as a lifelong cultural advocate, community activist, and neighborhood leader, I have a long record of pushing initiatives and standing up and standing out to make change. Most recently, I didn't evacuate, I never do. And for Ida, within the first three days, we cleared out our neighborhood playground of the debris. We stood up seven days of meal, food, and ice distribution. And then week before last, we picked up 1,500 bags of nasty, rotting garbage. Um, so before that, earlier this year, I was a founding organizer of the Save Our Soul Coalition to stop the City Hall move to the Municipal Auditorium. That was a three-month uh, campaign, and it's ongoing, and we're going to keep fighting on that. Earlier in the year, it was Martin Luther King Day that we came out um, to heal the community when we had several murders in the district. And um, before that, it's been, you know, we kept, okay. Thank you. Um, we'll move to Mr. Am Trump. I, I'm sorry, am I done? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, we'll now move to Troy Glover. Good day, Can you, I'm here. This is one of my favorite questions. And, um, you know, I appreciate all the work that's been done after Hurricane Ida. Um, and I, I even went out and picked up trash too throughout um, the district. But um, the, the, the district isn't look, looking to elect the trash person as a city council um, person. And I, we did it. It was an hour of responsibility. Um, but because the district needed it, we did it. Um, I was the past president of the St. Rock Neighborhood Association um, for five, two years. Um, when I was 25, the youngest president of the St. Rock Neighborhood Association, where I hosted them by backs to take guns off the street in the district. Um, I hosted Night Out Against Crime. Um, I was on a team that helped bring Crescent Care Hospital to the district because in our district, we had a lack of opportunity and access to health care. Um, and so we helped bring the, the clinic to the district. As the, as the um, New Orleans director for CEO, again, I've hired over 200 return, folks who've returned home from incarceration. At least 75 folks of those were in the district. I gave out a returning citizen stimulus of over $1.8 million in New Orleans. I love and, your time has expired. Thank you. I had like five seconds left, but I, I'll, I'll yield my <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry, madam. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Mr. Green, your minute is starting. Yes. In the district in which I've lived for most of my life, I've had an opportunity to over decades be involved with positive things and making a difference in our city in our district. For example, I've served on the Orleans Pirate School Board as an interim member, a very busy time. Um, I was appointed and worked hard and went around to our schools and worked with our schools. I've also served on the board of directors of Marion Central, which is the school that was located where the city, where the Holy Cross School is located right now. I've also served on the Levy District, and the Levy District has been very involved with District D in many capacities right now, in fact, continuing the cleanup in which I participate. But I, involved, I was involved with the Levy District on a very specific project that I'm proud of. As soon as I was appointed the head of the Commercial Real Estate Committee some years ago, I identified that rundown police station at the corner of Legion Fields and Lakeshore Drive, and we secured capital out of the money. We tore it down and we built a new station there. I'm proud of what I've been able to do over the years with the district, including with Mr. the Boys House and the time. like. Thank you very much. Um, next, we'll have Mr. Griffin Clark. Uh, some of the specific things that I've done in my district is, is, is being an advocate, um, especially for our youth and our young people, uh, whether it's in our education system uh, with my group, Erase the Board and A Plus Coalition, uh, whether it's a member of the Silverback Society or whether it is a member uh, and a board member of Step Up Louisiana, which is fighting uh, every day to make sure that um, we have a livable wage. Um, and not just again, not just a livable wage, but there's increases inside of those uh, wages. Um, one of the things we also do in our community is making sure that, um, I, again, I am a business owner in my community, so I pay taxes um, a, as a business owner and, and as a property owner in the district, um, making sure that we are thriving and, and have something here. Um, yes, post uh, Ida, since I only have so much time, um, I spent almost two weeks making sure that the trash is picked up in our district. Um, I think that is a very vital 
situation and thing because it's not just about trash and about an eyesore, but it became a health hazard. Um, selfishly a little bit because my son had asthma. This is one of the things that made me want to get out uh, and make sure those things happen. And so for over two weeks, I made sure um, that out of my own pocket, I went around in, in, in our district and also outside of the district. Uh, and also my business partner and I spent over $40,000 giving out small micro grants to our um, our champions when it comes down to our culture community, as well as our formerly incarcerated. Thank you. Um, next we'll have Miss. Uh, I'm sorry, Ms. Timberland Sands. I'm trying to get this computer thing to work with me. Um, so in my role as executive director of New, um, Neighborhoods Partnership Network for 15 years, I actually served almost every neighborhood in the city of New Orleans. But when it comes to District D, which is my home, I worked with the Milneyburg Neighborhood Association um, in helping to actually form their neighborhood post Katrina. Um, Milneyburg was the first neighborhood association that was able, even, even able to get a grant from Ganoff to get the signage for their neighborhood. Um, and from there, it became a spinoff that I started supporting other neighborhood associations within the district and other entities that wanted to do community organizing work to ensure that they had the resources and the capacity to do, do so. Other than that, I've also been a volunteer for several of the different um, parks, such as the Milne, um, Milne Park um, for my son. And you know that that's the whole point of the work that I did um, that impacted the, the district of D. Thank you, Ms. Sands. Um, for this second question, we'll actually start with you, Ms. Sands. The question for all candidates, and you have a one-minute response: Is the Urban League supports coaches and trains small business owners and entrepreneurs? As a council person, how would you support small businesses um, and their owners in your district like the ones we serve every single day? Ms. Sams, one minute. Come on. So one of the things that I think is missing is that, as I stated before, many folks don't even know what businesses exist in the district. There are so many businesses that are being underutilized, and I would like to actually spotlight them and highlight them. And so what, as, a, as a city council member, one of the things that I have is a pulpit to actually put the information out there so our district can know uh, what's going on. Instead of doing a neighborhood newsletter um, printout of what I'm doing, I want to showcase our businesses. I, I think that we can showcase and, showcase and spotlight our businesses. I would love to see how we would be... Um, utilizing various economic um, corridors throughout the district to actually do a spotlight on the district. So those are the things that I'm thinking of. Thank you, Ms. Sams. Um, we will now move to Mr. Griffin Clark. Uh, yes, one of, the, one of the major things that one, I would love to be a part of that, uh, a part of those coachings that the Urban League is doing as a uh, small business myself. Um, of several small businesses. Uh, also making sure that, again, as I said previously, um, that a lot of our small businesses, especially our home businesses as well, not just the ones that are brick and mortar like myself, um, but there's a lot of uh, people in our district. There's a lot of residents that have uh, home businesses. Some call them side hustles and, and things of that nature, but making sure that they know about the contracts uh, that are, are being put out by the city, making sure they're signed up for brass uh, to make sure when they do get these contracts that they are paid out uh, in a timely manner the city spends hundreds of millions of dollars a year from things such as uh, paper clips um, to, to actual paper to um, photography, videography, um, as well as, as, as things uh, such as catering and, and so forth and so on. And we wanna make sure that these uh, entrepreneurs are, are taken care of in that manner to make sure they know about these things. Uh, knowing this definitely half the better though. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Griffin Clark. Mr. Green? City should take a very proactive role in putting businesses to work on the projects that enhance our city. I'm pleased to have been the head of economic development and small and emerging business development when we had an open access plan which put especially minority and women-owned businesses to work. 
I'm a business owner who has owned for 31 years, 33 years of business nationwide real estate corporation that uses African Americans in the positions of plumbers, electricians, air conditioning repair persons, roofers, um, pest control, and the like, because we take a proactive role recognizing that the things that we do in that area help our city greatly. I've also been involved with projects that have enhanced our city's infrastructure through the Industrial Development Board. And I serve on a committee which makes sure that the Industrial Development Board, before it gives out payment in lieu of taxes, makes sure that those businesses are employing minority and women-owned, small and emerging, and local businesses. I will continue to do that work as a city council person using the experience that I've had over the decades putting businesses to work, either on a private sector or public sector level. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Green. I will now go to Mr. Glover. Mr. Glover. Yeah, I'm here. So first, I want to acknowledge like it's really hard to run a business, um, especially a small business. Um, and I think that starts with really building capital. In our city, 29% uh, of white households earn about $114,000, while 47% of Black households earns $26,000. Um, and so I think it's about the city government creating capital for uh, small businesses to get involved in the process. And one of the things that I would do is the fees for zoning are too expensive um, for small businesses to actually have equitable stake um, in that process. And then there's an office of community and economic, economic and community development um, that the city runs. And I think it's the, the council's job to hold that office accountable to make sure that the city um, is working for, um, for its people. And then act as a resource. One of the toughest things to do as a small business is to navigate a bunch of the city departments. The city council has authority um, and jurisdiction to really help small businesses um, navigate that. And then lastly, putting systems in place to track the progress of small businesses. Too often we start things, don't track the progress of how we're, um, if we're being, actually being successful. So ensuring that we're being successful in that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Glover. Ms. Clevenger, you have one minute. Yes, um, small business is the backbone of New Orleans and the double, triple whammy of COVID and uh, the hurricane has crippled our small business economy. It's amazing how many small businesses we've lost in the last two years. Um, and part of that is because we do not have a diversified economy. We are dependent upon tourism. So when tourism disappears, small businesses close. Uh, and, you know, District D has tremendous opportunity. We need to look at partnering with those four universities in our district and creating more opportunities there. Um, we also have a long recovery to go. So we need to look at, as a council person, we need to be able to look at how those recovery dollars are being accessed by not only small business, but micro business. Zoning, permitting, and licensing are some of the biggest challenges for small businesses to even start. And that has been something that is a concern for everybody. And we need to overhaul that idea. We supposedly have a one-stop shop, but I'm telling you, I have so many stories of people who cannot get through that process. So that's an important issue. Contracts, DBE participation, making sure our small business people are informed about the opportunities that currently exist and investing in the current brick and mortar businesses that we have that have been suffering before we do large scale development, before we bring developers in to wipe out whole corridors. We need to support the people who are already here. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Chantrice Burnett. So I will work with our small business community and local business community to make sure that they are getting accesses or having access to resources, which through the idea, like I mentioned earlier, with the quarterly uh, business forums with the small businesses, um, not only making sure that they have access to, access to the resource that the city has available, but also teaching them be best practices for getting into business with the city or state or on a federal level. Um, to gain some of the business contracts that, that we have to offer them as well. So by working closely with those small businesses and then offering them um, some sort of incentive for, uh, for helping uh, increase business opportunity or job opportunities 
for our youth and as for our formerly incarcerated persons to help engage those uh, parts of our community to find uh, self-sustaining work as well. So by working very closely with our business leaders and business partners throughout the district to make sure they have access to resources and are educated on how to continue to grow their businesses. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Burnett. Um, now we'll go to Ms. Ottoman. Hi, um, I'm not sure if you guys can see my video. It doesn't seem to be working at the moment. I might have to sign out and sign back in in between questions. But um, for this specific question about small business owners in our districts and the ones we serve every day, I would work with local, state, and federal officials to make sure all programs are advertised and available to our small businesses. <clears throat> I would work with the local chamber of commerce, the SBA, and our universities and trade schools for networking opportunities and making sure that everyone knows what is available to them now and how to get those resources as quickly as possible. Thank you, Ms. Arduin. Um, now we will move to our next question. Uh, again, all candidates have one minute to respond. Um, the Urban League and Power Coalition both advocate for racial equity every day. Um, by racial equity, we mean just and fair inclusion into a society in which all people, regardless of their race or their ethnicity, can participate prosper and reach their full potential. How would you as a council person fight for fairness and equity? Because Ms. Arduin um, is gonna log off and back on, I'm gonna, for this round, uh, start with Ms. Burnett and come back to Ms. Arduin after Ms. Sands. Ms. Burnett? I will fight for fairness and equity by making sure that the residents of my district are aware of all of the uh, all of what resources are available to them. Again, uh, right now in New Orleans, we have a unlimited, not an unlimited, but we have a great amount of resources that are available to the public. But I find that our biggest challenge is not doing a good enough job in marketing those resources. For example, um, there is an ironworks program that is totally free to you from 18 to 25 that teaches them a skilled trade that makes them certified not only nationally but internationally that on average can hold about 100 participants. Right now they're only averaging about 40 and every time I mention this program to individuals, nobody knows about it. It's a 100% free program for young men and women to be able to take advantage of their own lives and be self-sustaining. Doing a better job as a council person in marketing programs like that for our residents so that they can uh, have access and know that they, there are resources available to them is what I will do to make sure that I am uh, being fair and equitable for the residents of my district. Thank you. Thank you, you Ms. Burnett. Ms. Clevenger? Equity and inclusion is actually what motivates me in my life and has for my entire life. And New Orleans is about diversity. That's what makes us who we are. And to really fulfill that potential, we have to have the equity inclusion on the front end. For so long, we have marginalized people. We have made them exist at a living, you know, not a living wage, uh, a minimum wage that is not survivable. So. Supporting a living wage ordinance that's currently in process, making sure that criminal justice reform continues to do the right thing and, and make sure that we um, ban the box and that we provide opportunities at the school level, not just high school, not just college, but we're talking about preschool, kindergarten. We need to look at our school system and make sure we are being equitable and inclusive in terms of the opportunities that we're providing our youth. Um, you know, this is where government has to do the right thing because if we're not equitable and inclusive on the front end, then we leave people behind. And that's how we lose our identity as a city. So as your council member, I am definitely going to support policies and ordinances. Mr. Glover. 
Yep. Mr. Thank Glover, you. you have one minute. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll first say that every decision we make um, as a city, we should be asking who does it benefit and why. Too often decisions are made on the city level and across the city that aren't equitable um, to the people that need it to most. So transportation is a huge issue in New Orleans. Um, we are one of the, um, we have the, one of the highest rates of carless households um, across the country. So that means folks don't have access to transportation um, to get to opportunities. And then inclusive economic development for me is huge. In this city, um, there are about 14,000 young people that's not connected to work or school. For me, um, that's an opportunity to really create a diverse and trained workforce um, of opportunity youth um, that can really fill spots. And we have SUNO, UNO, and a few other universities in the city that can really help to lead that charge. And then I'm super happy that Act 406 passed, um, which essentially prevents um, discrimination against folks um, who have records. Um, because we know in this city we over incarcerate the most people and so that um, that blocks people from having access to that so i'm continuing to fight for equity and work mm -hmm. uh, and through those policies thank you thank you mr glover um we'll now go to mr green city has to be very proactive and recognize that in all of its decisions ordinances um terminations on investigations and um looking into what is going on with city government, that we must be proactive and make sure that we consider equity and inclusion and how important it is for the city of New Orleans to grow. We still have too many patterns of segregation. We have too many patterns that create long lasting poverty in our city, but not to say that there are solutions for, but what we, not immediate solution for, but what we have to recognize is that if our city is gonna be better in the long term, we need to do those things that work. When I was the head of economic development for the city of New Orleans, we had proactive policies in our open access plan that if you couldn't achieve the goals that were in, that were in place, you could be fined for your non-participation. We have to be proactive in our city, whether it be on an economic development front and call out bad actors and also be very proactive as a council in making sure that our citizens recognize that equity and inclusion and fairness are very important in the future of the council and also our city. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Green. Mr. Griffin Clark. Uh, one, of the, one of the things when it comes down to uh, equity in our city is that a lot of the people who we um, hold in place and we are elected and selected leaders in our city um, are the ones that are keeping us in this way. Um, and we are not making sure that we hold them accountable. We are making sure um, that we pad pockets and, and we let those type of things go. I've been a member of Step Up as well as a board member uh, recently of Step Up uh, for the past several years and, and helping with the uh, banner box um, with, on, in the state legislation and, and things like that. So making sure that not only are those ordinance like in, in laws are passed, but making sure that they have teeth. Using the bully pulpit that we have from the city council um, to make sure that they are not just fine, but fine heavily. And also that it limits their opportunity. People who are discriminating um, against citizens in our city are not just held accountable by fines, but making sure that they are, again, they are heavy and making sure that they, do, that they don't do it again by making sure that they do not have uh, access to do business with the city is one of the main things. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Griffin Clark. Ms. Sands. So racial, racial equity recognizes that racism is both systemic and institutionalized and that achieving racial justice requires addressing the root causes of inequity uh, rather than uh, bypassing it of any, any sort. And so to combat, to combat the historical legacies uh, of racism, we must advance racial equity by actively redistributing resources and investing in communities in ways that combat disparities such as mass incarceration, criminalization, on and under employment and poverty. You know, one of the things that I learned in early on in coming into this race is that we know we have 40% of our children that are living in poverty, but the majority of those children are being led by black women, head of household. And so we have to start doing some systemic things and start looking at developing affordable, accessible housing and transportation options and creating intergenerational communities. 
Thank you, Ms. Sands. Um, candidates, if you'll indulge me, I'm going to take some of our questions out of order. Um, this next question is a one minute question. We're gonna start with Ms. Sands. Uh, the question is New Orleans City Council is unique in that it is the regulatory body for Intergy New Orleans. There are community concerns about raising energy costs, particularly following Hurricane Ida. How will you ensure that communities do not bear the brunt of corporate costs? Again, one minute, we'll start with Ms. Sands. So in 2015, the OIG gave us a report giving us the, like the, all the information we needed to actually make decisions. And one of the things that caught me off guard is the, the amount of money we spend on consultants. Um, it, and the consultants have been with us since the like the 80s. I think one of the things that we need to start doing is really fine tuning the budget and talking about how are we, um, how are we allowing our, a, 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 a utility company to dictate to us for the people that we serve? And so as a city council person, you know, I, I would like to see us do more um, in cutting back on those consultants. Uh, I think that 96% of our regulatory budget is being spent on consultants rather than employees. So we need to pull back on that a lot. Thank you, Mr. Hands. Um, we will go to the next candidate, Mr. Griffin Clark. Uh, yeah, so one of the main things that we need to do when it comes down to, to regulating uh, energy and, and uh, organizations like energy is bringing in competition. Um, we understand that the, our current city council as it uh, is held right now, uh, they're talking real tough right now, but um, they've been in office for this past term and yet have not done anything with them. Um, even to the point to where now their uh, energy is playing games with threatening um, energy New Orleans, I'm sorry, is threatening to leave. And, and I, I say, let them go. Uh, again, bringing in competition. Um, I have the um, I, I have the the great fortune of of having um, friends and family all over the country, uh, and also having been able to travel. And one of the things that I saw um, when it came down to like living in Houston and stuff like that is that we had multiple um, energy companies, and it made sure, it made it to where uh, the bills were were much cheaper. And I, with anything, again, as a small business owner, one of the reasons that my prices is the way that they are is because I'm not the only game in town. And when you and when you um, take money from people like Energy and you play both sides, like some of our uh, politicians and some of our people are, you get what you're getting right now. And again, we have to make sure, like I said prior to, that we not just hold their feet to the fire, but we actually put teeth to a lot of these laws and a lot of this, this regulatory speech that we're speaking of right now. Thank you, Mr. Griffin Clark. Um, we will now move to Mr. Green. Mr. Green, one minute. In terms of the question of what we do to stop entity from passing on the cost of Hurricane Ida and the like, we are the regulatory body of Entergy and they are entitled to a certain return on their um, investment. Very honestly, we just don't allow it. As a council, I can tell you right now, if there's anyone from Entergy listening, I'm not gonna allow the passage of anything where the burdens of Hurricane Ida get passed on to our um, ratepayers. Also, I think there are a lot of federal resources out there that we really need to take advantage of and that we can do in this infrastructure bill um, that can supplement some of the losses that took place on Hurricane Ida. I'm not sure that there's going to be a loss to energy at all. And finally, with the, with the last few seconds that I have, I'd like to introduce this as a possibility. We've assumed ever that regulating energy, a private company that is profit driven, is the best way to go. I'd like us to consider and think about the possibilities of municipalization, maybe if not the entire structure, maybe some of the infrastructure, if not the operations. But that's the way I would stop them from passing on the burdens of Hurricane Ida. I would not vote for it. It would not pass. Thank you, Mr. Green. We'll move to Mr. Glover. Thank you, Jay. So I think, it's, I think this is a really good question because um, it was highlighted even more during Hurricane Ida um, about some of the inequities that, that are often go to get to residents. But I would say um, um, this is we've seen when you make safe choices that you don't get 
um, that you don't get real change. And I think this election cycle is a pivotal moment to not make a safe choice and actually fight for real change. So the, the city council is the regulatory body for energy, and we have control over the vote on whether or not energy gets to raise rates. Um, and for me, that's a simple no. And I think too often we do studies on issues that we know the answers to. So for example, we're doing a study right now on how energy has delivered services. Well, you can just ask the next door neighbor or the person that I've been canvassing with. And for most people will say the services that um, energy has delivered hasn't been up to par. And then the last thing is we created a storm fund um, for things like this. The problem is energy can go into the storm fund without any vote from the council. So ensuring that if we create things, it's smart practices and policies that actually benefit people. Thank you, Mr. Glover. Um, we'll now go to Ms. Clevenger. Energy has failed the people of New Orleans. Um, it is one of the biggest cost burdens that we all bear. They have been failing us for years and our city council has been going along with them and the, all the consultants and everybody who's been making a payday off of this. As a for-profit company that's regulated by the city council, they have not lived up to their end and we continue to reel from the cost burden of this. We cannot allow them to put the IDA cost on us. After Zeta, we had three major utility poles fall in the street and catch on fire, only to find out that these utility poles that serve so huge of an area were completely eaten by termites. So where is all the money that we have spent for infrastructure on every bill that we pay with Intertree gone? We need a total reform of Intertree. We need choice. And we need a city council that's willing to stand up. I have claim stated at the beginning of my campaign that I would not accept any contributions from Intergy or any utility companies because it's a conflict of interest. And now the council has, has stated that they are going to pass an ordinance that states that no one can do that. But Intergy is now looking at going to the Public Service Commission of the state, which also can accept contributions. So yes, reform Intergy, choice, consider it being a nonprofit or municipal, municipal, municipalizing, excuse me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Clavenger. Ms. Burnett? Yes, so uh, one, I would not support any uh, rate hikes on the consumers from this Ida um, devastation. And then what we can do is make sure as, as we are holding energy, we hold energy accountable on a regular basis. We don't just wait for an incident to happen and say, oh, well, now we do an audit on energy. Energy should be getting audited at least uh, every by year on a regulatory basis so that we can see what's coming in and what's going out. Um, also by um, doing an in-house audit on energy, not just uh, hiring outside sources to come in and, and make sure that uh, they're being regulated properly, but make sure that we have an inside uh, team of people that are regularly, regular, regularly checking in on energy and making sure that they are not doing anything that they're not supposed to and that they are maintaining the uh, grid infrastructure as they are supposed to. Um, that is what I would do to hold energy accountable. Thank you, Ms. Burnett. Um, and lastly, uh, for this question, Ms. Arduin and I apologize. I did not realize you were back on for the last question. So um, uh, you have one minute for this question. Thank you. Not a problem. Thank you for the question. First, I'd like to start out by saying that um, everything that I say regarding this question are my own thoughts and opinions and are not um, issued any statements from Intergy themselves. I'm completely thinking on my own and um, strategizing as such as well. I have not accepted any contributions from any utilities, nor do I plan to. I um, currently do work for Intergy, and there's nobody more qualified or better positioned to address consumer needs with Intergy than myself. I am the only candidate who can affect necessary change from within the organization, and proactively, I believe that we do need regulatory audits in proactive stance instead of reactive. 
I do believe that we need to hold all utilities accountable and ensure that we are also advocating for the infrastructure bill that was uh, that's trying to be passed by President Biden to to ensure that we get the dollars that we um, deserve for such updates that are required in our area. Thank you, Ms. Ardwin. Uh, we will uh, now start again with Ms. Ardwin with the next question, uh, which again, respondents have one minute to uh, provide their responses. New Orleans is receiving over $100 million in federal American Rescue Plan funding. What do you think is the best use of those funds to promote uh, an equitable recovery from Hurricane Ida as well as COVID recovery? Ms. Arnwin? Sure, I'm off mute. Um, so reflecting on my top priorities, everyone benefits from the infrastructure improvements, roads, drainage, economic development. Shame on us if we don't use the majority of these funds on these critical areas and I'll defer the rest of my time back. Thank you, Ms. Arduin. We'll now go to Ms. Burnett. You have one minute. Uh, so with these funds, from my understanding, most of the, the funds are under most of the power of the mayor's office, but with the council having any control over, the, over these funds, I would say the priority you should go to those heavily affected by COVID, which are a lot of our local and small businesses that are now no longer operating because of the long effects that we have been living with due to COVID-19. Uh, one of my favorite places, uh, Sassafras, is no longer a staple in District D. It has closed because of COVID-19. So if those funds are available, I would say that we should find ways to target those funds to people who are heavily affected, may have had to close their business or cannot sustain their business, as well as families that were directly impacted by COVID experiences or sicknesses, so that they can get themselves back to a self-sustaining uh, place and be productive uh, citizens within our community again. That's how we use those funds. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Burnett. Ms. Clevenger? Ms. Clevenger, one minute. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. Um, could you repeat the question? I'm sorry. Sure. The question is, New Hello? Orleans, can you hear me? New Orleans is receiving over $100 million in federal American Rescue Plan funding. What do you think is the best use of those funds to promote an equitable recovery from Hurricane Ida and COVID? Well, I think it's actually more than 100 million and, and it is a, a major concern because as we saw with the uh, federal uh, funds available over the last year and a half, two years, uh, so many people were not able to access them. And uh, if they are sitting in the mayor's office, then the council has an obligation to advocate and not only advocate, but push for equitable distribution, small business, housing, landlords, yes, we had rental assistance, but it's not enough. And that's what we're seeing. We also need to see, look at people, they're hurting now in terms of rebuilding their homes. This is something that's really not being talked about so much in Orleans Parish, but we have so many homeowners of fixed income and, and low income that are not being able to sustain. Your time has expired. Um, we will now move to uh, Mr. Glover. So we need to be very smart and we need to be very equitable and inclusive. Time has expired. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think Morgan is making really good points though. We're still living in a pandemic and we're recovering from a category four hurricane. And so for me, it's about one, putting a spending plan to that money to ensure that it gets to people. Um, and two, um, really uh, uh, ensuring that um, when we do spend the money, um, we have an account with the money. If I told you that one out of five people in Louisiana um, were considered hungry, um, you would say that's crazy. That's the worst in the nation. Or if I said that 50% of the cost of housing has increased by 50% um, since Katrina, um, but wages hasn't gone up. So for me, it's about the basic needs for people um, to ensure that they can take care of their everyday needs. 
um, and support their families. I think that's the biggest priority for that money is to ensure that the basic needs of our residents and our city are met. Thank you, Mr. Glover. Mr. Green? One minute. It's important. It's important to um, spend the money in areas to directly assist people who have been impacted by Hurricane Ida and COVID and the like. We have suffered in some areas. We have opportunities in some areas. For example, um, on the area of affordable housing, we've lost a lot of affordable housing, but with a pool of monies available that could assist small developers, for example, in building affordable housing, we should get some of those units back online. I'd like to see a pool of money available in the form of either low interest loans and grants available for businesses such as Sassafras that can show easy evidence that they've been impacted by both the hurricane and the, um, and the COVID pandemic. I would like to work with the mayor to have some smart policies in place that look not just at what happened, but look at the future and see how we can get our businesses and how our citizens the monies that can help them to rebuild. So it's a question that is difficult to answer within a minute and I always run out of time, but I will tell you, I would like to work with the mayor to spend that money on a variety of ways, housing, business, and the like. Thank you, Mr. Green. Mr. Griffin Clark. Uh, I think one of the major ways we need to make sure that, um, of, of course, you know, we aren't the ones that are in control of most of that money. However, we can guide our mayor uh, with a lot of that um, spending. So one of the things that I believe we need to do is directly, um, as we're as we're continuing to do now, is giving that money directly to the landlords for the renters. Um, there's a there's a huge stack uh, of paperwork that's on. Uh, Mr. Austin Badon's desk when it comes down to, to those who will be getting evicted real soon. Uh, I have a friend of mine who one of his tenants owes him upwards to $30,000 uh, in rent uh, since the, the pandemic has started. And so um, helping to make sure that our uh, low income families have some and, and, and medium income families have somewhere to stay, but also making sure um, that our landlords and, and people who own property um, are taken care of as well because a lot of the mortgages and things like that for people like us have not uh, stopped. And so well, let's be honest, a lot of our landlords uh, are not like multiplex landlords and, and several businesses, they have one or two properties. Um, and that, that's taken a, a toll on them where some of them have even had to put their property on the market. Um, another thing is small right. business grants. Uh, to, I'm sorry? Your time has expired. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, and lastly, for this question, we'll go to Ms. Sands. So both COVID and Ida did what disasters do. They exposed already the existing disparities. And what I believe that we need to focus on is really engaging our community to ensure that everyone has access to the information about where, these, um, where this money can go. So I think we should combat the health disparities. We know that was very, um, very much connected to COVID. We need to provide grants and other economic assistance to our small businesses so that they can recover and grow. Um, implement a child tax credit and other financial programs to support our families living in the district and in the city. And then the last but not least, we really need to address the eviction crisis. Uh, the data on the evictions is appalling and disproportionately impacts Black women and children. Um, so that, that is what I believe how we should utilize that money. Thank you, Ms. Sams. Um, candidates, we're going to bypass the uh, question on uh, living wage and other policies. We hope um, that you do support. Um, those initiatives, but in the interest of time, we're going to move forward to closing statements. Uh, each candidate has one minute um, for a closing comment. Um, again, I apologize for cutting you guys off. Um, all of you have very um, great things to say, and I hope that the voting public meets you on the campaign trail to learn more about what you would do for District D. Um, I'm going to start um, with Ms. Ardwin um, with her closing comment. Ms. Arman, you have one minute. Thank you for inviting me to speak to your group this evening. My name is Chelsea Arduin and I'm running for New Orleans City Council District D. I would be honored to have your support, vote and endorsement. My challenge to you is to make a difference. 
For far too long, we've promoted the status quo. Post Katrina, we had an incredible opportunity to rebuild a better future for New Orleans, and we failed. Crime is worse. The Sewage and Water Board cannot do the one job it has. Buildings and streets are literally collapsing. How did we go wrong? We promoted failure and got failure as a result. It all comes down to how we prioritize our budget. Right now, public safety should be our primary and emergency concern and focus. We need more police. We need all levels of criminal justice system communicating, police, DA, judges, community leaders, et cetera. We will not be able to attract good jobs until we have crime under control, period. Let's move all the jobs and functions of the Sewage and Water Board to the Department of Public Works. The days of newly paved streets dug up by the Sewage and Water Board three weeks later need to be over. Streets, infrastructure, plans are great, but without leadership to properly carry out and execute those plans, they are meaningless. Let's map out our streets based on priority of worst to best and start fixing them. You have to start somewhere. Kicking the can down the road won't cut it. To those thinking I can't win because I'm a Republican, let me ask you, do acts of violence and crime have a party affiliation? Do drain pumps vote Democrat? Do broken streets vote Republican? Most experts have predicted a 26% turnout citywide. There are enough voters of all parties that are frustrated at the lack of progress that will vote for new leadership regardless of party ID. They want change and they want action. I can be the leader to bring positive change as a council member for District D. Please endorse me, Chelsea Ardwin. Thank you for your time this evening. And I apologize for going over. Thank you. Ms. Chantrice Burnett, your closing statement. You have one minute. Yes. Thank you again, uh, Power Coalition and Urban League for posting this forum and giving us this platform. I, everyone, is Chantrice Burnett. I am number 53 on the ballot and I am in this race because I know the residents of District D deserves representation that matches their interests. We deserve safe communities, paved roads, and real economic opportunities for our families. And that is why I'm in this race today, because it is time for new, fresh leadership that represents all of us and not some of us. I am asking for your vote to represent your interests and to represent you. I am Chantrice Burnett, number 53 on the ballot, and I would love your vote. Thank you, have a great afternoon. Thank you, Ms. Burnett, Ms. Clevenger. Hi, I'm Morgan Clevenger, running for City Council District D, number 54 on the ballot. District D is the heart and soul of New Orleans. Uh, it's incredibly diverse, and we need someone with that diversity of life experience and work experience and boots on the ground, community activism and neighborhood leadership. I am that person. Of our city. And as others have said, we continue to kick the can down the road. This is a pivotal moment. We have to make sure that we move forward and upward and right some of the wrongs that we have seen created over the years. Intergy, utility reform, property tax reform, living wage, criminal justice reform, and also crime prevention. More resources for, more resources for our young people, diversify our economy, workforce job training that's different than what we've seen. We have so much opportunity and District D needs a leader that's present, that's accountable, and that listens. Because I know the best way to serve the people is to listen and find solutions, work together. We love our city and we need our city to love us back. Thank you, Morgan Clevenger, 54 on the ballot. Thank you, Ms. Clevenger. Mr. Glover. I, I wanna thank both the Urban League and the Power Coalition for this time. Uh, we're just in such a pivotal time in our city's history, right? And this election cycle is more important than I think one have been in a long time, whether that's from uncertainty in school, not getting our trash picked up, not being able to keep a roof over our head, Things are just um, at a standstill. And only in New Orleans can the same boy um, who was impacted by the same traumas of the city, raised by a single mama, dad got killed when he was one, arrested at 17, end up being the same person that's running for city council, director of an organization, president of the St. Rock Neighborhood Association, been fighting for this district for the last 10 years. That's a byproduct of New Orleans. And that's what this, that's what this district needs. My work and track record speaks for itself on everything that I've done. I love this district. I love the people of this district um, and we deserve better. 
We haven't been getting better. We deserve better. We have some of the most historic neighborhoods in the city, Seven Wall, Punch a Train Park, Treme, St. Rock. Um, and this district deserves leadership that, that represents that. Thank you for the time today. I appreciate y'all. Thank you, Mr. Glover. I will now go to Mr. Greens. I am so pleased to have had this opportunity this evening to participate in this forum. I'm also pleased to be able to run for um, election in a district in which I grew up, a district in which I raised my children, in which I attended schools and the like. I enjoy living in District D and I wanna see more improvements come to District D so that more people in our, in our district can enjoy the enhancement of the quality of life that I will bring as a council member. I am pleased to be endorsed by a number of elected officials and organizations with whom I will work to enhance the quality of life in our district. I'm endorsed by State Senator Joe Bui, um, former councilwoman and state representative and state senator Cynthia Willard Lewis, also Irma Dixon, former um, public service commission member, also school board president Ethan Ashley, also um, the AFL-CIO, the Orleans Parish Democratic Executive Committee, the Independent Women's Organization, the New Orleans Coalition, and other organizations such as the United Teachers of New Orleans, they recognize that experience matters and that this is an extremely important election. I would appreciate your support working with me and those who have endorsed me to bring positive change to our district. Thank you for this opportunity this evening. Thank you, Mr. Green. We'll now go to Mr. Griffin Clark. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Urban League and Power Coalition. Uh, thank you guys so much for hosting this forum. Uh, again, my name is Kevin Griffin Clark. I am number 58 on a ballot. Uh, I am, again, a husband, a father, uh, a minister, a community leader, an advocate. Um, in a lot of ways, I am what this district embodies and, of course, what this city embodies. Um, from growing up the way that I did and from uh, bringing and making sure that I, my family, making sure that my community has what it needs, um, I will make sure at, that I am a fighter on that city council bench to make sure that we have what we need and not to play games and not to play political games uh, with our families and with our people's lives. We have had that for far too long. Um, yes, I know I do not look like um, what a city council person has normally looked like for the past 20, 30 years, but I think that is one of the main reasons that uh, I should be elected to make sure that we create a uh, real change and that starts from someone like me, that starts like from someone like me that throughout my whole entire 20, 30 plus years of, of doing this advocacy work, I have never left our community. Uh, all of the work that I've been doing in our community has been for free and without a check. Uh, my track record speaks for itself and that's the work that I'm going to do uh, when I'm elected. Thank you guys so much. Uh, make sure you check out my website, kevingriffinclark.com. Uh, we got work to do. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Griffin Clark. Uh, Ms. Sams, closing statement, you have one minute. So thank you again, Urban League and Power Coalition and Jade, you're moderating. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you and the audience out in social media. You know, when I came back in 2007, my son who is now 23 years old was the same age as my seven-year-old daughter now. And not much has changed, you know, my decision to run for city council, this city council seat, is because I care too much about this city and this district. This was my choice to be in this district. The stakes are just too high. And the policy decisions made by our city council impacts future generations. And I'm here to cash in on those promises. I envision a city where all residents have equitable access to economic opportunities, healthcare, nutritious food sources, affordable housing, quality schools, information and tools to prepare for and adapt to the impacts of climate change. And the, citizen, the city's residents are regularly engaged in civic processes to, to, to impact their own lives. I am prepared to lead and I'm ready to serve. And my name is Timalyn Sams. Some call me Tim and I'm number 63 on your ballot. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sams. And thank you to all of the candidates um, for your courage, for your leadership um, and for your willingness 
um, to serve. And so um, I will um, um, close by just thanking again the Urban League of Louisiana and the Power Coalition um, for hosting this forum. I will turn it back over to Judy Reese Morse, our CEO and president, who will provide just some closing reminders. Thank you and have a good night. Thank you, Jade. I'm actually going to take it from here. I'm Nicole Jolly, the Vice President for Strategy and Engagement with the Urban League. Just to give you all a few reminders, I know we are out over time, um, but want to make sure that you uh, all know that the uh, recordings of all of the forums from this week and the last um, will be posted on the Urban League's website. We hope that you will share them and make sure that other residents of your districts have access to the information that you saw this evening from your candidates. And then, of course, we have um, the dates that we want everyone to know about. Given the impacts of Hurricane Ida, the dates have changed. So we want to make sure everybody knows that voter registration deadlines are now October 13th, if you want to register to vote by mail or in person. And then you have until October 23rd, if you want to register online at govote.com. And then the election dates have also changed. So early voting will be from October 30th to November 6th, and election day is now on November 13th. So please mark your calendars and make sure that everyone you know is ready to go vote. And lastly, um, we had a huge uh, 2020 census campaign that we ran in 2020. Um, and the result and the importance of the 2020 census is what we are doing now in the redistricting process as a state. So uh, every 10 years, the state legislature uses census data to redraw political maps. So even the council districts that you all heard from Council District D tonight, um, those districts as well as state level um, districts like Congress, your state, uh, state legislative positions, the House, the Senate, um, as well as local uh, district lines, including school boards and city councils. All of that is being redrawn um, in order to accurately reflect our current population uh, based on that census data that we were pushing so hard to get accurate in 2020. This is about fair representation. So the reason we are mentioning it tonight is so that you all can know about it and get engaged. Um, the state is leading a roadshow um, campaign for public comment. So this is a chance for you all um, to be actively engaged in making sure that we have fair uh, representation in our districts and in our elected positions. Um, so all of this information will be available on the Urban League's website and it is available on the Power Coalition's website. The roadshow starts later this month and will happen across the state. Um, New Orleans in particular, please mark your calendars for January 5th um, where the roadshow will be hosted at UNO and again, please note our website so that you can stay up to date on what is happening with the redistricting process. And with that, we will thank all of the candidates for participating this evening. Thank you, Jade, our uh, board chair for moderating this evening. Um, good luck uh, to all of you and we'll see you at the polls on November 13th. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, thank Urban you. League and Power Coalition. Thank Have a good you, evening. Nicole. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Good night. Thank you all.